your gate. You have to run your own race. You have to go the distance for yourself. Your pastor, I'm sure Reverend Hall can preach on to a frenzy, but he can't run the race for you. Your Bible teacher can probably teach you the great intricacies of the Bible, show you the nuances of what the New Testament says versus the Old Testament, but at the end of the day, they cannot run your race. Your father and your mother, your sister and your brother, they may have relationships with the Creator, but they cannot stand before your Maker for you at the end of time. Welcome here. Jesus, you can be the company that I don't kick out after a couple of days. Amen? We want you here, Lord, with us forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen? What a jambalaya of worship you guys have here. It is often you come into a stale house of worship. But indeed, at Calvary Baptist Church, you guys are alive, and the Holy Spirit is moving and shaking. The Shekinah glory is kind of thick up in here. So I just thank you, God, for coming into this place and showing up when we call you. Amen? Amen. But we really didn't have to call the Lord. This is the Lord's house. Amen? So he's here when we got here. Amen? First, giving honor to God, who is indeed the head of my life, the producer of the dope soundtrack of my faith, and the wonderful creator of every good and perfect gift that I might have, I say namaste. Namaste is a Sanskrit word that we use at the St. Paul Community Baptist Church where I serve as a minister that means the Jesus in me or the divinity in me salutes and acknowledges the divinity in you. Amen? Amen. 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 It's one thing for us to see each other, but to say I see God living in you is a whole nother piece. So I say namaste, Calvary Baptist. Thank you for saying that back. I didn't expect that one. Amen. It's a privilege to stand here before you today. I'd like to thank the angel of this house, my Morehouse brother, Pastor Hall, for his extraordinary leadership and his ability to listen to God's will and hear the cry of young people in the wilderness of modernity yearning to be like Josiah or Jeremiah or Barack Obama or Jay-Z for that matter. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, in your absence for setting up a space for young people to be free to worship in their own way. And thank you for allowing me to be able to come as I am, amen? To the first lady in her absence, I say hello. I give her an ooh ooh because I understand that she is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, amen? Which I'm also a member of, amen? Amen, we are wonderful women of God to serve to all the servant leaders in their respective places, serving God's people, amen? And to the executive director of this church, Mr. Aubrey Kelman, brother Aubrey Kelman, my friend. Don't blush. My student, may God continue to to place great mentors in your life and allow you to serve God's people with the understanding that they are God's people and they should be treated gently even when they're acting ugly. Amen. Because sometimes the people that we serve are a reflection of us, so we need to have some compassion. Amen. Also, may God work with you, Brother Aubrey, to make sure that you turn your papers in on time (laughs) before the semester is over. I thank you for inviting me to the prestigious 
Calvary Baptist Church in Jamaica, Queens. I feel like I'm at home. When I first moved to New York, I lived in Rochdale Village. Amen. Right around the corner. Amen. So I feel like I'm at home. And you guys have been so hospitable to me. Amen. I'd like to also um, say thank you to my elder, Elder Yusuf Ham, who is accompanying me today. Amen. To make sure that I... Thank you, Elder. Got it. Now let's get down to business. The scripture for today is Hebrew 12, 1 through 3. It's a familiar text, and it's a text for this day, a theme going the distance. I'll be reading from the, new, the contemporary English version with a little NDS remix. So I'd like to ask you to stand for the reading of the word because I believe that the word is holy. Also, y'all look good, so I just want to see what y'all got on. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Where's my young friend? Hi. I just, yes, you. I pray God for you. For you are ministering at such a young age. I ask that God continue to watch over you and to anoint your hands and your heart so that you continue to play for the Lord. Amen. It will take you places. Amen. Amen. The scripture. We have a large crowd of witnesses all around us. So, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially the sin that just can't let us go. And we must be determined to run the race that is ahead of us. Can we all say ahead of us? Yeah. Ahead of us, not behind us, ahead of us. We must keep our eyes focused on Jesus who leads us and makes our faith complete. He endured the shame of being nailed to the cross because he knew that later on he'd be glad that he did it. Now, he's popping. He's seated on the right side of our God's throne. So, keep in mind this Jesus. Jesus who caught the shade from all of his haters, amen, and some sinners, because sometimes haters and sinners go hand in hand, sometimes. He taught us how to deal with them and to keep focus on Jesus. And if we do, we won't get discouraged and we won't give up. We won't give up. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Use me, God. Take hold of me, God. Speak through me, God, and hide their faces. Embolden my spirit, Lord, so that you might be glorified, so that your people through this word could be edified, so that the evil one, the Satan, is horrified because your people are unified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pray with me as I come to you with the topic, Religious Marathon Training 101. Don't look back. Religious Marathon Training 101. Don't look back. As they said earlier today, I am from Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, born and raised. In the playground is where I spent most of my... See, I went to church with Will Smith. That's how Philly I am. Grew up in the same area where Wilter Stilt Chamberlain. Y'all might not know who that is, but he's an icon. Amen? Amen. Cheese steaks. Water ices in Roosevelt Boulevard. Soft pretzels. The Liberty Bell. And though he's not from Philly, I look at Dr. J as a patron saint of our city. And I know that he's so overwhelmed right now because the Sixers are doing their thing in the playoffs. I know I'm not, I'm not speaking to a basketball congregation. Yeah. Amen. I would be remiss also not to bring up that it's 2018 and that the current Super Bowl champs are the Philadelphia Eagles. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And while I live in Brooklyn, I still bleed green. My mama bled green. My daddy bled green. Everybody in my family is almost like we got wings. We are Eagles fans. Sports are a part of my life. I'm from Philly. And most people don't like Philly fans because Philly fans are a bit much. Amen. Amen. We are a sports town. And we have this huge sporting event, this, this legacy event in Philadelphia every year. It's called the Pin Relays. 
Amen. I feel like y'all been there. The pin relays are like the U.S. version of the Olympics for amateur track and field athletes. And every spring, people converge onto the city for an opportunity to run their best race against the best in this country. I, I remember being a kid and my mama bringing us, all of us, to JFK Stadium and lining us up in the bleachers so that we can watch the games. We would sit up high in the bleachers and we would look down and see the athletes stretching and preparing and conditioning for their race. I learned the lesson from these athletes that, that could easily translate to my life today, particularly in ministry. Now, this, this thing that I observed is that every athlete, every race runner, has to prepare in their own way for their own race. So profound. They have to prepare in their own way for their own race. Now, see, you might have a coach. And while he can prepare you, the coach can't run your race. While you got a trainer, he can condition your body. He can get you into the gym and have you lifting weights. But your trainer can't run your race. You might have teammates, partners. You're ride or die. But when you're on the track and that pistol goes off, it's not about your friends or your partners. It's about you and whether or not you got a good striding gait. See, they can't run your race. And forget about the pin relays for a minute. Let's just apply it to our lives. It's all about you, your stride and your gait. You have to run your own race. You have to go the distance for yourself. Yeah. Your pastor, I'm sure Reverend Hall can preach on to a frenzy, but he can't run the race for you. Yeah. Your Bible teacher can probably teach you the great intricacies of the Bible. Show you the nuances of what the New Testament says versus the Old Testament. But at the end of the day, they cannot run your race. Your father and your mother, your sister and your brother, they may have relationships with the creator, but they cannot stand before your maker for you at the end of time. Judgment day will come and you will be required to account for the race that you run. They cannot run your race and that leads us to our text in the scripture the writer sets the stage for new believers to understand that there is a marathon that goes to our faith walk speaking to an oppressed people he utilized cultural symbols of the roman arena and the Colosseum to talk about the focus that a christian must have when they're deciding to follow this christ this arena uh, would have been familiar to the Jews at the time because they were oppressed by the Romans and would have been required at one time or another to go to the arena to see the games or the races. Clearly, the writer is taking a page out of Jesus' textbook on how to teach, his doxology, his pedagogy on how he should teach. This is a teaching tool called association. As an athlete, I can understand the, the device that the writer is using because I, too, understand about running a race and living a Christian life. Yeah. It's resonated with me because I neglected to tell you early on, but back in the day, I used to run also. I was an athlete. See, my twin sister was a sprinter. She did the relay stuff. But I, my passion was cross country, yeah. marathon, distance running. It prepared me for ministry, even though I had no clue that God was pouring something into my life. Is that someone's testimony today? That God has placed you in a certain place at a certain time to learn a certain lesson that you did not get it then. But now, with a little bit under your belt, you understand that God was speaking directly to you and has given you what Oprah Winfrey likes to call an aha moment. It's in our text I understand that every time I would go out to a meet, there would be a crowd of witnesses there to love up on me and to cheer for me. And, and all these folk wanted me to win, and that's all well and good. But the problem with that is that in life, there are a few crowds of witnesses that are only with crowd pleasers and people that want you to do well. Mixed in there, there's some haters. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. There's usually some haters in the midst of the crowd of witnesses watching you run your race. 
And the problem with me, I don't know about you, is that there could be a thousand of people cheering me on, but I'm going to concentrate on the two or three that got something crazy to say. Amen? Amen. They'll become my distractions. And distractions are sure to come in your life. They're sure to come while you're trying to run your race. And y'all, there's too much work for us to do as Christians in the vineyard for us to be worried about the distractions from people who are petty. Lest we become petty. And I'm not just talking about people out in the world. Because there are people outside who might look at the church and say that we are petty and corny. And you know why they think that we're petty and corny? Because sometimes we act petty and corny. We get distracted by the dumbest stuff. We get distracted by the person next to us in the pew. Sometimes we get distracted, and we're not talking about people out in the world. We're talking about people that we know. We get distracted by what the choir is singing that we don't like. Amen. What well, so-and-so got on. What well, pastor just preached. They just made us say ouch or amen. And sometimes we get distracted by our own obnoxious Christian superiority complex, thinking that we are better than the people that are outside of these walls. I don't preach for amens. I preach to tell the truth. Amen. We become distracted by all things that go on into the church. And then we miss the main purpose of the church. They have a focus on the king. It stops us from effectively finishing our race, running our race. We, it, it affects our gait. It affects our stride. I found it in my studies and in my life and ministry that one of the things that stops us, that holds us up, is looking back. Looking back will trip us up every time. More than the haters... More than the distance that you have to run, looking back to see who's coming up after you will jam you up every time. And you know what else would also jam you up when you're looking back? Looking back on the things that you used to do and who you used to be. And they're sure you slow you up first for the obvious reason. If you are running your race, the forward direction requires you to do this one thing. To be forward. Amen? Amen. You got to be straight ahead. You can't look backwards if you want to go forward. It's simple. Secondly, life is like a rearview mirror. Things oftentimes appear closer than they really are. So if you're constantly looking back on the rear mirror of your life, the things that you think God and delivered you, you're going to still keep looking back as if that was something you was just yesterday. We, we, we keep focusing on the crap back there. And indeed, we need crap because we know the crap becomes fertilizer. I don't know if y'all from the South, but you need a little bit of crap to fertilize anything that's going to grow healthily in your life. But other than that, you need to let it go because it's going to hold you down. Looking back makes us focus on who we were last year, who we used to be when we were not under the cover of God, how we used to pop off and indeed... I believe Jesus popped off every now and again, and sometimes y'all let me know if y'all need to pop off every now and again to somebody. But you need to not let that be your foremost character, that when people see, here they say, oh, here she come with that big old mouth. It's not who we are now. But if you look back, you are tempted to believe that. The scripture says we must rid ourselves of everything that slows us down, especially the sin, remembering of the sin, the embarrassment of the sin, all of that, we got to get rid of it and be determined to run the race that is ahead of us. And sometimes even go the distance when we're going it alone. Amen. I got three points and then I'm out because it's a beautiful day. I know y'all want to get up out of here, but not before y'all get a word from the Lord. That's all I'm saying. So the point one Looking back will break your momentum and deteriorate your form. Anything in life that is worth something will require you to have some sort of form. There's always going to be a need for energy and speed and momentum. 
I can't imagine anything that won't require that, and it says that that's not important in your life. So when you look back as a runner, even as you are a sojourner in your faith, if you're looking back, it's going to do one thing. It's going to break your form and your momentum. When you're turning back, just the gesture of turning back distracts you from what God is calling you to do. The basic movement shifts your posture and sacrifices your efficiency. It shifts your energy back there on a reality that you cannot change. You can't go back and change it. All it will do is break you down, and that is Bible. In Philippians, it says that we need to press on to take hold of that which Jesus Christ has taken hold for us, forgetting what is behind us and striving towards what is ahead. What if Peter stayed stuck on denying his Jesus several times? The Lord would not have been able to use him for the first day of Pentecost. What if Moses kept concentrating on killing a man? Would he have ever been able to lead the Jews out of bondage into the promised land? What if Paul only concentrated on him persecuting the Christians? Half of our Bible will be disappeared. Amen? That is just straight talk for straight understanding. When you concentrate on who you used to be, it's almost as if you are negating what God has done and where he has brought you from right now. Looking back takes away all the glory that God has done in your life, even right now. Point two, when you're looking back, it puts you in the wrong mindset for Christian ministry. What is Christian-centered ministry? As a mindset, it is one, is one where everyone makes a, a concerted effort to discover their personal and unique giftings and then encourages each other to serve God in the places where they are equipped to do so. But if you are looking back, you are not keeping your eyes on Jesus, who's supposed to lead and be the completer of our faith. You're not looking at that guy when your mindset is off. And that's why I love this particular ministry, an intentional ministry to young people, to young adults that focus on creating love languages and safe spaces for the millennials and the homelanders and the generation Xers. He said 40. I'm 44. So I was like, dang, I'm not a young adult anymore, but I guess. Amen. You know, he tried to play me out. But anyway, this is a ministry that caters to all of us in our different ways and how we look at God in the multiplicity of all that God is. God is not just one way. And even in the church, when we tend to look back at how we used to do things, amen? I know this church don't know nothing about looking back and saying, we did it this way back in the day. We don't got to. Well, when you do that, you're limiting the power of God and you're saying that God is not a here and now type of God. Amen. I, I know that I'm stepping on toes, but this is the young adult day. So I feel like I can say something to represent the young adults. Amen. They can kick me out the church. I'm good. So I'm going to say some things for you. Amen. Amen. God is bigger than that. God is not a here and now God. God is the type of God that operates in the eschaton. That means that God operates in the future and what will come, but also also was the God that operated way back then when the earth was being formed in his hands. We serve a mighty, a mighty big God, the type of God that created all of the universe. And then he rocked them around his, the enormity of his neck like a Jesus piece. That's the type of God that we serve. Y'all talking about God has the world in his hand. But God rocks our world like a baguette on his pinky finger. Stop playing games. We serve a huge God. So to say that our God can only operate the way that God used to do it back in the day is disrespectful, not just to the people that you're serving, but to the God that you say you love. God wants us to move forward. God wants us to move forward, and God wants us to move forward with the model of, of the relay race where we can be in leadership but understand that there's going to come a time when we have to pass the baton. We have to pass the baton for that next person to run. We can't be looking back and getting off on our own selves off the glory old days, what we used to do back in the day when the church was this way and that way, and hinder the new thing that God is doing in a new 
generation. What kind of God do you serve? What kind of God do you serve? A small God or a big God? We run the risk of looking back and forgetting how big God is. And point three, after we realize that when we look back, it's going to cause us to slow down. It's going to break our form. It's going to put us in a wrong mindset. We need to look at this marathon of Christian faith and understand that when we look back, we send a notation to the enemy and our haters that we're tired and that we're insecure. That we're tired as Christians and that we're insecure. When we look back, we we send a signal to our naysayers that we are not confident in the path that God has laid out for us. That where God has set us up, that we really don't belong there. That we're not supposed to win this good race. And then I think about Cardi B. That's my girl. And I think that invasion of privacy is actually a quality project. If y'all don't know that, ask your grandchildren. (laughs) Ask your your kids. She got a gutter mouth, like some of us. Amen. She got a checkered pass. Like some of us. She's done some things, y'all. Like some of us. But what I like about her is that she does not allow who she used to be to define who she is. She does not allow people to throw these labels on her and hinder her progress. People can say what they want, but she keeps it pushing. She keeps it moving. And as a black woman in ministry, a weird ministry that I don't always fit in people's boxes, amen, That kind of affirmation just speaks to me. And while Cardi reflects back on her life, she's not looking back. It's important to reflect back, but she's not looking back. She thinks about where she was and what God has done to move her forward. And she understands that that's a part of her story. And she uses that to talk to other people. See, I was a Cardi fan before she was on Love and Hip Hop. Yes, I watched Love and Hip Hop. I watched Love and Hip Hop New York. I love Love and Hip Hop Atlanta. I rock Hollywood. I I, I watch it all. And I understand that there was a metamorphosis that was going on with this young lady. To see where she was then and who she is, it only could be God blessing her. You got to understand, she just put a record out last week. But she's already then made history. And only God can open up any type of blessing. I think God opens... Either God is the dispenser of all things good and wonderful, or God isn't. It can't be just good when it's talking about us, but it's good on people that we don't think God should love. And I noticed, I noticed how Nicki Minaj wanted to drop her Barbie teens and Chung Lee after that. But I look at Cardi B, this is some, this in-house talk. Cardi B didn't respond. Because Cardi understands that what Nikki thinks, what anybody thinks, has nothing to do with her living her life and looking forward and running her own race. (laughs) Running her race and looking towards her her marriage, her new baby, the millions of dollars she's about to make, the the, the different desires of her heart that God just felt felt compelled to give unto her. It makes us feel uncomfortable that God could be compelled to love Cardi that type of way. But when she's running her race and not wondering what you're doing with your race and not wondering what you're doing on your race, it's going to happen. That's a lesson we can apply to ourselves. And then I think about my Savior. Amen. I think about and wonder if my Savior ever looked back. I wonder if he looked back and remembered the stories of how Herod killed all the baby boys because they were afraid of what a strong black man might do to his kingship. I wonder if Jesus looked back on that. I wonder if he looked back at the time he was in the wilderness as a young person, tempted by the devil, all by himself, almost neglected by God. He had to figure it out on himself, being in the wilderness by himself. I wonder if he looked back on that. I wonder if he looked back at his cousin being murdered for doing ministry. Did he get scared? Did, they say, did he think they were going to come and do that to him? Did he look back? 
Did he look back at all of the ways that the men around him treated women, including the men that he walked with? Amen. How they treated humanity, the sick, the leper, the blind and the poor. How they treated him. How some would talk about him like a dog all day long and then in the dark of night creep up and ask for a blessing. I wonder if he looked back at that. Did he wonder about how his boys would sell him out? How he asked them to pray with him while he's praying and, and blood is coming from his forehead like sweat. How one of them sold him out for some silver. How the other one denied that he even knew him. Did he look back 